Hello, my name is Richard Alberts. I'm here with Owen Carolyn of University College Dublin, who today on Friday, September 12th, is our very first guest for this new video interview series at iConnect. Owen, thank you very, very much for your time today. Thanks for having me, Richard. So, Owen, let's talk today about Irish constitutional law. What have been, over the past year or so, the major developments in Irish constitutional law? I think the past year or so, the primary theme in the kind of constitutional and political discourse has been the question of constitutional reform. That's been the case for four or five years, and those discussions have culminated in the last 12 months in a number of referenda to amend the constitution. Uh, one to abolish the Senate, which was rejected by the people. Uh, one to establish a new court of appeal, which was accepted. Um, we've had a constitutional convention um, operating over the last 12 months or so that has concluded with a number of recommendations for reform. And that in turn has led to the possibility of further referendum next year, up to six apparently the government have suggested, dealing with questions such as the abolition of the offence of blasphemy, gay marriage, uh, the position of women within the home, um, there are changes to the voting age, changes to the age for president. Um, so the, it's, it's an interesting time in terms of the flurry of amendments that are going on at the moment at present. What explains this intense focus on constitutional reform in Ireland? I think it's part of a more general debate about reform of governance that began with the economic crisis in 2008. Obviously, there was a collapse in confidence, and the collapse of the economy, a collapse of the banks, and a collapse of confidence in public institutions. And that led to a significant upsurge of public demands for change. Um, but those demands ranged and were somewhat incoherent in terms of, or unfocused, I think is probably more accurate, unfocused in what they, what they sought to change. But it led the political parties in the next election to all commit themselves to political reform. So I think from that perspective, the constitution is something that the political parties you know, want to look at. You might more cynically suggest that constitutional change is not political change and that changing the constitution has less impact on elected representatives than, for example, changing how they're elected and how they operate. So therefore, I think it is the more cynics would suggest that it also it diffuses some of that debate by focusing on the constitution. I mean, I mean someone, someone, someone put it to me once by saying, when, when the economy, economy works well, well no one credits the Constitution. Constitution. So, so it seems a surprising response to economic collapse to focus on the Constitution alone. Hmm. So it's, it's one thing to want to change the Constitution, mm -hmm. but quite another for political actors and the people to actually succeed in changing the Constitution. So how hard is it to change the Constitution, to formally amend the Constitution? I think in international, international terms, terms, it's, 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 it's relatively... relatively um, easy to change the Irish constitution. Um, when it comes to a referendum, the referendum is a simple majority referendum, so there's no quorum requirements, um, there's no super majority. The majority of people who turn up on the day if they vote in favour of a proposed amendment, then the constitution is amended. Um, where the matter becomes a little more complicated, I think, is the only institution that can initiate a proposal to amend the constitution is the lower house, the dole. So, and in effect, because of the way the Irish political system works, it's like a Westminster system. That means the government of the day typically controls the lower house. So the government have to want and agree with the proposal. Um, so they have a monopoly power in terms of initiating proposals. But once the proposal is initiated, it's relatively straightforward. But as I say, it has to be something that the political actors and the political elites are in favour of. So while we've had, for example, this flurry of uh, constitutional amendments, Something like abortion that's more divisive and controversial and has given rise to, in the last 12 months, substantial public controversy. There's no proposal to have a constitutional referendum on that. Now, you mentioned abortion. I wanted to turn to that, actually. Mm. Uh, why has there been such a focus on abortion over the past 12 to 18 months? Well, abortion is a constitutional question in Ireland because in amendments in 1983 that was inserted into the constitution, uh, which guarantees... The, the, or guarantees respect the equal right to life of the mother and the unborn. Mm. And that's, at the, at the time, time was all the article said, and that therefore gave rise to interpretive difficulties when it came to difficult cases. Um, there, there had been an uneasy stalemate, stalemate since 1992 um, in Ireland where the Supreme Court in the case called the X case had decided that the Constitution permitted abortion in the case of um, a threat, a physical or mental threat to the life of the mother. Um, there, there have been a number of specific cases in the last 12 months that have renewed attention on that issue. And the government responded to, to one of those cases in particular by legislation to clarify the law. Um, that led, I mean, that, I think, brought public attention back to this question. And there are various groups that are unhappy with the current situation. You know, those who think that 
having or though they don't permitting remorse at all is to is, is to um well, it's, it's something that shouldn't be allowed. Those who think that the rules are too permissive, and on the other side, those who think the rules are too restrictive and don't cover things like, for example, they don't allow for termination situations of fatal fetal lateral normality. So there is a debate going on about the appropriate approach to that on the Constitution. But as I've said, the government are very, I've said they don't want to have a referendum on it. And you would suspect that because it would be divisive and controversial, both publicly but also within the coalition government parties. And perhaps internationally as well. Absolutely. I mean, it's, 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 it's obviously an issue that arises, arises or gives rise to controversy where it arises. So, um, and as I say, because we have a coalition government, one party is traditionally being relatively liberal on the abortion question, the other party has been traditionally more conservative. So I think they find it difficult to agree even on clarifying the law to go any further and have a referendum is something that would cause them difficulties internally. And I think that's why um, they don't, they've said that it, it's something for after the next election at the earliest. Uh, Owen, can you comment on the function, use of constitutional conventions in Ireland? Yeah, yeah the, the constitutional convention, convention is a relatively novel, novel experiment. experiment. It's the, the, the first, first time we've had something like this. Like this. Um, as, as I've, I've mentioned, mentioned the, the, the amendment process, process is typically controlled by political elites. elites. Um, but, but there was a, a, an, academic an academic and public campaign around the time of the last election to involve citizens more in the constitution and the process of constitutional change. And that led to the establishment of a constitutional convention which involved 66 ordinary citizens and 33 elected representatives. And the idea was that they would get together and discuss issues. Um, they would vote on issues that were sent to them by the government. So the government set the terms of reference. Um, and the government would then respond by either accepting, rejecting, or amending their proposals. Um, so it was an interesting experiment. Um, and it led to, it led the convention suggested a number of changes and the government, as I said, had committed to holding referendums on some of those um, and have yet to respond in relation to some of the others. Now, would you say that the convention was a success? Perhaps. I think it was a qualified success. I mean, I think it certainly got a lot of positive comment, certainly a lot of positive media comment and a lot of positive academic comment. Um, equally, the politicians and those, in, and those citizens who are involved seem to have regarded it as a very worthwhile exercise. And some of the debates are very high quality. At the same time, I think sometimes the claims made on behalf of the convention have perhaps been overstated. Um, they're, they're, it's, it's been very much presented as this is citizens changing their constitution. But obviously, you, know, you had 33 elected representatives. More, more fundamentally, you also have the fact that their terms of reference were set by the government. So the government identified the majority of topics they could address. And, and things like changing the voting age from 18 to 16, changing the age of the president from 35 to potentially 21, they're not really fundamentally important constitutional questions. Um, even the question of gay marriage, which was sent to it, you could argue that was done, again, to avoid problems for the government between their the more, the more liberal and conservative wings of the government. So, so I, think I think it's been interesting. interesting. Um, I think certainly there are aspects that have been successful, but I think it's careful not to overstate um, the extent to which it's um, only citizen deliberation. I mean, I think just having the citizens in the room doesn't necessarily um, mean it's all their own work. Yeah. So for those of us interested in comparative public law, mm. what should we be looking to in the next six, eight, twelve months um, in Ireland? What should we keep our eyes on? I mean, I mean, I think there's a number of interesting international um, or questions, questions that have an international dimension. One I mentioned, mentioned the, the government, government had committed to holding a referendum on gay marriage. So that, so that will happen in um, the next 12 months. And I think that will be interesting to see. Because obviously, our constitution has a Catholic dimension to it. Um, and I think that how, they, how the, the public response to that will be interesting um, as part of the broader international trend um, and, and, and debate on gay marriage. Um, as I say, we also may see developments of blasphemy. Um, and the, the constitution, constitution again has an, a, a constitutional offence of blasphemy. blasphemy. That's, That's something that has, has given rise to controversy in, in, in relation to freedom of expression, as against you know protection of religious beliefs and, and so on. So that's something that I think again internationally may have a dimension to it. Um, and there are proposals to, to re-establish the convention to address other issues. And again, if if the convention is re-established, I think it will be interesting to see whether it proceeds in the same fashion, whether some of the lessons from the first experiment will be taken on board in the second. Fascinating. Now, uh, as a scholar at UCD, you are very active not only in organizing scholarly events, but in publishing important work, most notably on the separation of powers. So could you tell us uh, what you're working on today, uh, both in terms of events that you're organizing uh, and papers or books that you're working on? Well, in terms of events, we actually we recently held last, last, last weekend um, a very interesting workshop um, in University College Dublin um, on the future of the small state. 
Um, that, that was partly a response to, to some, some of the issues we've been discussing in terms of Ireland's response to um, the economic crisis and how it's manifested itself in demands for constitutional change and how they've worked. Similarly, Iceland or other countries in Europe that, that have responded to that. And of course, um, the vote next week in Scotland. Um, you know, looking at you know, why are these debates for, um, why are these demands for independence in Scotland being made? Why, do, why is there a vote in Catalonia um, in November? So those are very interesting events and I think we brought together a really interesting mixture of young scholars and, and that was very worthwhile. Um, in terms of my own work, um, the, the, what I'm working on at the moment is the, something I've written a little bit about before, which is the idea of kind of collaborative constitutionalism, which is a development of my separation of powers work. Um, which is trying to, my previous work is focused on administrative agencies, and this is focusing more on the political legal dimension of the separation of powers and trying to develop a particular theory of how that should operate. Um, so I'll be presenting on that next week at uh, the Cambridge Public Law Conference. And then hopefully, based on the feedback I get there, writing it up into something more coherent and publishable. Hmm. Well, fantastic. I look forward to reading that, as I'm sure uh, our, our now viewers do. I was going to say readers, but now we're going to have viewers. <laughs> uh, Excellent. Oh, and thank you very, very much for your time today. This has been very informative, and we look forward to reading your work. Thanks, Thanks again for having me, Richard. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.